It's the 25th of March, 2022. This is a Room Now podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. I don't know if you heard, but Room Now Live last week, a raving success. Of course, I was raving about it. You know, you're expecting that, but so was everybody else. A different kind of meeting, tons of discussion. The panels were just killer. You're going to be able to see it if you weren't there. Now, you could go and register and see it right now online, Um, but if you want to wait, we're going to roll those out uh, in the month of May and in early June uh, on Tuesday Night Rheumatology, and then throughout the month, you'll see bits and pieces of the lectures. Again, we have five, no, excuse me, seven different pods or sessions on rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, spondyloarthritis, lupus, uh, and hot topics. Um, and I got to tell you, they were just great. Um, look forward to that in the month of May. Why aren't we doing it sooner? Well, the month of April is a gigantic month for us because we have a campaign in April on psoriatic arthritis. It's called PSA All the Way. We're talking PSA nonstop starting April 1st and going through the month. I think you're going to be shocked at the amount of content we have and what we're going to be covering. I want you to look forward to that. And if you're not interested in PSA or pissed off about PSA, you will be by the end of the month. It's going to be interesting. So today we have a bunch of stuff on OA, a bunch of stuff on inflammatory myositis, a bunch of stuff on lupus, and a bunch of stuff in between. So let's start. Let's start with prehab. It's the cousin to rehab, that thing you should do when you're going to have joint replacement surgery. A French study was put out this week showing the value of prehab prior to total knee replacement. This is a prospective randomized trial in 262 knee OA patients who are over the age of 50 who either had no prehab or they had this prehab program. When they looked at the patients post-operatively um, and their independence and mobility, it was significantly better in the prehab group. I've been advocating for this for a long time because that's exactly what I did when I had bilateral knee replacement surgery. Uh, I was not good on not able to do my usual workouts on the elliptical and bike and treadmill. I was doing a lot of pool instead, but my knees were killing me, but I still was working out. So by the time I went to surgery, I actually had fairly strong legs and my therapist, my orthopedist, they were all shocked at how well I did. And, and they said that in fact, this is the way to go. So there are many reasons why patients don't do well post-operatively in surgery, one of which could be that they didn't get prehab. And you can do pool, you can do stationary bike, there's a lot of things that you can do. So we've talked in the past about the questionable ability uh, or utility of intraarticular steroids in patients with knee OA. A new report this week appeared on MedPage today, we published it on Room Now also, that really was now an assuring report. I know I've given you a bunch saying, Intraarticular steroids are bad, they don't work, they have no long-term benefit, blah, blah, blah. But this one was a follow-up study that basically showed that if you did intraarticular steroid therapy, that there was no increased risk of disease progression, that's often been stated, that maybe taking steroids would lead to some kind of charcoal joint problem, or a subsequent increase or doubling of the risk of 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 subsequent knee replacement surgery or the need to progress to knee replacement surgery, I should say. So that's encouraging news. You can find that on the website. How about TENS? I'm sure you have plenty of patients who use TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation as treatment for pain, all kinds of pain, including knee pain. Um, It's often used more for spinal pain and whatnot, where it has questionable results, if you ask me. This particular study, 220 patients with active knee OA were randomized to either receive TENS or placebo or sham TENS. And they looked at pain outcomes after three weeks. Guess what? It didn't work squat. And I don't mean they couldn't squat. I mean it didn't work. There was no difference in between the groups between sham and the actual real thing, which I'm sure cost a lot of money. And there were no differences as far as side effects or even secondary outcomes. The primary outcome here was a Womack pain score, the subscale score. So 
what's the deal with these tens things? Little, little magical boxes with electricity and wires and everybody loves them. And why do your patients love it when you tell them the data shows it doesn't work? Well, because it was recommended by people they trust. That's right, their neighbor, the, um, you know, the waitress at the diner, you know, their um, coffee guy at Starbucks. Um, again, trusted sources recommend these electrical contraptions that do cost a lot. Uh, I think last year, um, the electrical stimulation market, and I'm talking about tens, was I believe around five billion dollars. Um, so, and it's only going to go up in the next few years. Uh, again, if you're tired and burnt out in rheumatology, get yourself some kind of little black box with wires, um, make up some claim, sit back and count the money. You could do that. I'm not going to do that. That would be immoral, I think. Um, interesting research from um, those who are interested in RAILD. You, you saw, I think, Jeff Sparks' report in the England Journal um, last year, maybe, maybe more than a year and a half ago, about the MUC 5B promoter increasing the odds of ILD. Another report here from the Mass General Biobank, over 1,000 RA patients, and they did the um, promoter variant study and found it in 15%. The patients who had this we're going to be those who are at increased risk of I, RA, ILD, a 3.3 fold increased risk. And they also saw this in those who had an RA onset after age 55, um, uh, odds ratio 1.52. I thought that was interesting. So should we be doing this in our, our RA patients overall? I don't think so. Would I do it in someone with symptoms? Yes. Uh, is it commercially available? I don't think so. Not quite yet, but soon should be. More research is needed. Um, a Swedish study looked at a very large cohort of patients o uh, with systemic sclerosis, 1,774, um, and to come up with the actual incidence in Sweden of systemic sclerosis. They found a prevalence of 22 cases, 23 cases per 100,000, an incidence rate of 11.9 or 12 per 1 million patient years, and that it remained stable over time. Systemic sclerosis was five, to one, five times more likely in women than in men. This is a rare disorder. These numbers are exceedingly rare. I just wish they were even more rare because this is the hardest thing I think we manage in rheumatology. Or shall I say, don't manage in rheumatology. We need more. And again, this last year was a good year. We saw a number of drugs being approved for systemic sclerosis. We need more research, more tools, more insight. I don't know if you do this. I don't do this. This being, do you do a search for malignancy in someone who's been diagnosed with inflammatory myositis, polymyositis, dermatomyositis? I don't. I do a search that would be commonsensical, meaning I do normal, um, you know, things that are appropriate for the age of the individual, a good history, good physical, good exam, you know, health maintenance measures, and if nothing pops up, as far as a cancer risk, uh, I don't go any further. And there's been a lot of talk in the last two years about an algorithm for searching for cancer in these patients. Previous studies have shown that those who are at higher risk of malignancy associated with inflamm idiopathic inflammatory myositis were more so men uh, over the age of 50 and more so with dermatomyositis. Maybe there you take a big look. But now people are looking at these other things. Here we're looking at a Spanish study, a 10-year study that looked at the uh, utility of PET CTs in newly diagnosed inflammatory myositis patients to see if it had a utility. So they did this in 131 um, uh, or 77 of 131 of their myositis patients had PET CT screening for occult cancer. The area of the curve was 0.87, um, and they said that this was a useful procedure. Again, I don't think we have good controls here. They said that those that did not undergo um, cancer, occult cancer screening, did not develop cancer after a median of three years. So there must have been something about the 77 of the 131 who were a reason enough to do a PET CT. PET CT would be a good screening test. It just cost a bazillion dollars, and I don't know whose insurance is going to pay for that just because they got a diagnosis of inflammatory myositis. 
again, I think we've covered this in the past, what the current recommendations are here. I think good common sense should be the driver for further investigation. Um, speaking of inflammatory myositis, one of the more difficult subsets that has cropped up in the last few years are those who have uh, MDA5 antibody positive um, um, myositis, and, but they tend to be what? Clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis, meaning they don't have occult my, or evident myositis, they don't have weakness, um, and their muscle enzymes are normal. But these MDA5 positive have impressive skin findings, rapidly progressive lung findings, all compatible with myositis. I've had two patients with this die. So this is not just something that's seen in Japanese or far uh, Eastern patients. This is seen pretty, pretty much around the world. Um, it is could be part of the myositis um, antibody panel one might draw. Uh, this is a really dangerous group. And these two, these patients are also at greater risk of, of cancer, as are the patients who have the NXP uh, um, antibody profile. So in this particular lit review, that, uh, 15 studies, 388 patients, they looked at how are they treated? Because that's really the big question. Nobody knows the right treatment here. Nothing has panned out to be the uh, odds-on favorite for a better response because the outcomes are so poor. There's only one poorly done randomized controlled trial. The best survival, the, the author said, was seen with high-dose steroids and then immunosuppressive. Can you imagine this? They uh, spoke in favor of the use of cytoxin and the calcium neurin inhibitor cyclosporin and tancrolimus. Um, sometimes with the worst cases, refractory cases, uh, plasma exchange, tofacitin, and rituximab were tried, but they didn't come out strong for those. They didn't come out against them. They just said, that's on the menu. These are tough patients. Um, I like this particular report that compares head-to-head -head adalimumab and methotrexate versus methotrexate escalation in PSA. This is a control trial. It appeared in Lancet Rheumatology. They looked at biologically naive PSA patients and they treated them with, with methotrexate, 15 a week. If they didn't get better, then they entered the trial. Um, and then they either had escalation of their methotrexate or they kept their methotrexate 15 and adalimumab was added. They looked at them 16 weeks later and the primary endpoint was MDA, min um, uh, minimal disease activity in PSA. The patients who had the combination of adalimumab and methotrexate did better than those with just methotrexate escalation, like 41% versus 13%. Turns out that um, those responses were maintained for the next 16 weeks in 80% of patients. That was all good. What happens to those who didn't respond? Well, if you were on adalimumab and methotrexate, they escalated therapy by going to weekly adalimumab as started out, it was every other week. If you were on the methotrexate uh, escalation group only, they added adalimumab. And in those patients, in the next 16 weeks, they got another 30 plus percent of patients. The bottom line here is that they said that it'd be wiser to add adalimumab in someone not responding to methotrexate than to try to further optimize methotrexate or increase the dose of methotrexate to 20 to 25 milligrams. Now, now they didn't say here whether they ensured absorption by going to split dose oral methotrexate or to parenteral methotrexate. So maybe it would have been a little better if they were in fact doing that. But clearly, I think everyone would agree that adding the biologic makes more sense here. Uh, a nice study from um, the Montreal General Hospital has a large lupus cohort looked at the influence of rainouts phenomenon in their lupus cohort. They had 489 lupus patients. They found rainouts in 35%. The presence of rainouts in lupus was associated with being female, white, having CNS disease, the RNP autoantibody, and was negatively associated with hemolytic anemia and cellular CAS. I guess that would be a surrogate for renal disease. I think all that fits. Female, check, white, check. Um, R RNP antibodies expected. CNS disease I found surprising. Look for that in your patients with Raynaud's phenomenon. We had a, a few more lupus reports uh, that we're going to end with. One is that um, lupus patients undergoing any kind of surgery, uh, non-cardiac surgery, 
especially, had a higher risk of cardiac events. So this was claims data. It was a study that I think looked at the Optum, Optum uh, um, insurance database. Uh, it was published in ACR Open Rheumatology. Almost 5,000 lupus patients compared to almost a half million um, diabetics and 1.5 million non-diabetics and looked at what happened after surgery, non-cardiac surgery. Um, and not surprisingly, lupus patients had a higher rate of, of MACE, major adverse cardiac events, compared to non-diabetic controls, the 5,000 versus the 1.5 million, with a 51% increased risk of cardiac events or MACE events. But the MACE event rate was the same in the lupus patients as it was in the diabetics. Now, we know that diabetes has an increased risk of uh, cardiac events, and so it's not surprising that lupus would be running neck and neck with them. What they found that was, I think, important here was that if the patients had uh, other risk factors for cardiac disease, you know, cerebrovascular events and et cetera, it's called the R, uh, uh, sort of a comorbidity score, the RCRI score, that if, if you had a higher score there, you had a higher rate of cardiac events. More importantly, and surprisingly, lupus patients with a high comorbidity score were less likely to have undergone preoperative cardiac testing, suggesting that if your patients are at risk for cardiac events, you should be undergoing a full-scale cardiac workup prior to having any surgery. My partner forced me to see the cardiologist prior to my knee replacement surgery because I'm a little chubby. She didn't like uh, the way I looked. I went and got the echo, EKG, and clearance, and my cardiac surgery, not my knee surgery, went perfectly well. Other evidence of poor outcomes in lupus, especially lupus patients not on target, target being low disease activity as measured by you, the expert. This was a prospective multinational longitudinal lupus cohort that looked at 3,384 patients followed for a mean of 2.4 years. And oh my goodness, the number of patients that were not under optimal control, I find shocking. The number of patients in, that never achieved LLDAS, low um, disease activity in lupus, was 24%. The number of patients with a sleet eye uh, 2K score greater than 4 was 34%. The number of patients in high disease activity with a sleet eye 2K score greater than 10 was 25%. And that all three was associated with higher organ damage, higher glucocorticoid use, and worse um, quality of life outcome measures. More importantly, Patients with that did not achieve the LLDAS or had high disease activity had a five-fold increased risk of mortality. This is unconscionable. We have to do better in our patients with lupus so that we don't see these outcomes. Let's end with two call-in cases in Ask Cush Anything. Again, you can go to the website, record your case or question, and we'll discuss it here on the podcast. Our first one is from uh, Dr. El Nadi who's going to ask about um, Raynaud's phenomenon and anti-centromere antibodies. I have a question about, uh, I'm Dr. Abbasantanedi, I'm a professor of rheumatology at Penha University, Egypt. Um, I have a patient, 29 year old, uh, just complaining of Raynaud's with the typical triphasic uh, uh, changes and her RNA is positive. Her anti centromere is highly positive. Echocardiogram showed uh, pulmonary estimated artery pressure 30. And only she came for an exam with ANA positive. Then, after further analysis, there's centromere. So, no skin thickening, no edema, no pitting scars. CT chest has been requested, pulmonary function test. Patient, patient is not uh, dysnic or complaining of any other complaint. So I think we have a subclinical systemic sclerosis here. Is there any way to uh, stop the disease from evolving? How to manage such cases? And thank you very much. Hi, Doctor. So thank you, Doctor Alnadi. Um, I have an easy answer and a hard answer. The hard answer actually means no answer. The easy answer is you don't treat a lab test. Anti-centromere antibodies is not in itself uh, preclinical scleroderma. 
She does have rain outs and anticentromere does go along with rain outs um, by itself and may yet well evolve into um, a limited form of systemic sclerosis. There are reports of patients with um, anticentromere antibodies uh, with primary pulmonary or with pulmonary hypertension. And yes, many of those do have evidence of scleroderma that was discovered secondarily, but there are isolated reports that are out there, albeit those are rare. I don't think the profile of the anticentromere and the rain outs gives you any opportunity to treat something that's not yet there, meaning scleroderma, with the hope that you'll further um, protect the patient from what may happen in the lungs. These are difficult cases. When I see these cases, I usually write or call the experts. We just had Dr. Virginia Steen at uh, Artie Kavanaugh's RWCS meeting uh, in Maui, and, and she discussed cases like this. But you need someone who has seen a bazillion um, scleroderma and variants. So that would be, you know, those uh, like Dr. Steen, like uh, Dr. Rich Silver, and others at the University of South Carolina. Uh, and other scleroderma mavens, I think talking to them or emailing them for further input. But I, I, I can't recommend anything other than what the pulmonary doctors would recommend to treat that pulmonary hypertension. Uh, our next case actually has to do with flares of rheumatic disease after COVID vaccination. Hi, Jack. Um, my name is Haitam. I'm a rheumatologist. And I've got a question about um, rheumatoid arthritis flare um, after COVID-19 vaccines. So we know from data that um, it's a potential um, risk um, estimated to about 5% of patients uh, uh, got a flare after the, uh, after the vaccines. My question is, um, which of the available vaccine types is less associated uh, with uh, uh, RA flare. Okay, uh, Haitham, thank you very much. Um, I don't believe there's good enough data right now to say that one vaccine type is better than another. Generally, the the side effect profiles, the um, uh, the rates that have been seen for all the side effects are roughly similar. One difference being that the risk of that pericarditis rare side effect is, or pericardial disease side, pericardial side effect has been seen mainly with the Moderna vaccine um, and mainly after the second shot. So that's um, maybe worth noting. But I, I, in my review of this, I found low rates for pretty much three different antibodies. Uh, I didn't find any reports uh, easily for the J&J &J vaccine, but um, uh, both in the U.S. and in Europe, rates, again, are low. Uh, I think I thought the five percent number was a little bit um, high compared to what I, I see, but yeah, there's numbers to support that. I've seen rates of of one per one hundred patient months. You know, assuming that you're at the peak of vaccination season, so I, there is no one um, that you should use so that you would avoid this. There are a number of studies that have looked at the rheumatic disease flare rate after vaccination. And um, three that I found that showed that it was no higher after vaccination than flare rates prior to vaccination, suggesting that maybe they don't increase flares. But yet all of us have seen cases where patients got the vaccine within two days, they had a big flare, it lasted for three to 10 days and was gone, maybe made worse by steroids. Often flares, rheumatic disease flares uh, occur uh, within, um, again, two days are more likely after the second shot with an mRNA vaccine. Um, and uh, the things that have been seen, um, half the cases, a little more than half the cases, are flares of existing rheumatic and autoimmune disease. And then the rest are actually de novo new events. But those two do get better with time and symptom management. So this is curious. I know I've talked my, uh, about my interest, Stills disease, a bunch of cases that have come on with the use of the COVID vaccine uh, and new cases, and then those that and, and those died down with time, 
and then uh, flares of Stills disease after the COVID vaccine. So there's probably something there. Um, and in, in activation of the inflammasome, release of cytokines and other mediators that would lead to disease flares. But, you know, I, I, like I saw one of my patients who I thought didn't have a flare of his RA, although that's what he thought it was. I thought it was a neuritis, but in retrospect, I think it probably was CPPD. Gout and CPD P P D have also been um, known to flare after these vaccines. So, and, and that's also an, an innate immune response driven process, is it not? So anyway, interesting cases. Thank you for these great cases. Again, if you want to record one, go to the website or the email and look for Ask Kush Anything. You, can, you need to be on your desktop, record it, make it a short question, a short case. If it's really long, I'm not going to answer it because this podcast is already already too long. At least that's what you tell me. Tune in next week for more on the podcast. <laughs>